Praise the Lord. I welcome you to our leaders' uh, development session tonight. And I bless the name for your faithfulness. Being always there, always available. Available and faithful. And I pray that as you are making yourself available every time, the Lord will continue to prosper the work in your hands. And I believe that you will never be the same, your family, your ministry, everything about you. Everything will be going in the positive direction in progress in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name. We glorify you because of the way you make us ready, make us available, make us faithful in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, because you're giving us the passion. You're giving us the compassion as well. And the alertness and the faithfulness to get the work done. We're praying, oh Lord, we'll continue in this zeal, in this faithfulness, and this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. Especially at a time like this, when we need to be vigilant, we need to be watchful, we need to be protective, we need to touch the lives of all our members and all the workers under us so that nobody will backslide and nobody will go back to the world, but we will do the work in such a way that people will be stable in the way of the Lord and the word of the Lord and the work of the Lord in the kingdom in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered once again tonight. Open our eyes of understanding that we may behold and see wondrous things in your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Tonight, we are coming to the last chapter of Job. And as we have been studying from Job, and you see that as that is it, that we ought to have done today is Job chapter 42, verses 1 all through to 17. It's the last chapter of uh, the book of Job. And as we come to this uh, book of Job, uh, the topic we're dealing with is uh, the gateway to the highway of full redemption the gateway to the highway of full redemption. As we look at Job chapter 42, verse 1. In verse 1, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Then in verse 2, it says, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholding from thee. It goes on in verse 3, Job still talking to God, and he said, Who is he? that hideth counsel without knowledge. Therefore, have I uttered that I understood not. He's making confession now. He's telling the Lord, all those things I said, when my friends said what they said, and I replied them, and I spoke about you, and I spoke about my suffering, I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. And then in verse 4, it says uh, here, I beseech thee, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare unto me. Now in verse 5, is uh, coming to uh, it's, it's a state of confession, and a state of conviction. He said, I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. That's why it says in verse 6, over here it says, wherefore, I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. He came to the point, realized what he had said, realized all the discussions, he realized all the statement about the Almighty God, and he said, I said all that in ignorance. I now abhor myself. I now depreciate myself. I now see that I'm, I just have to repent and he repented in dust and ashes. And then God has a good attitude towards him now because it says, and it was so, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the sinner that is right as my servant Job has. 
I want you to see what uh, God now called uh, Job, what he had called him earlier in chapter 1. My servant Job, what he called him in chapter 2, is still now coming back to that. There's a new relationship because of that repentance. And it says, as my servant Job has said, and now in verse 8, he's instructing those three friends what they are to do. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. I want you to notice that again, my servant Job. Job now was dear to the Almighty God. And it says, Offer up for yourselves a bunch of rain, and my servant Job shall pray for you. And my servant Job shall pray for you. Do you see how many times now God is referring to Job and he's saying, It's my servant, it's my servant. Look at this. For him will I accept. He will pray for you. It's, it's not even praying for himself. It's, uh, he has repented. He has called upon the Lord. And then it says, He will pray for you. For him will I accept. Lest I deal with you after your folly. In that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. I just want you to underline all those uh, references, uh, all those referring to Job, my servant Job, my servant Job, my servant Job. In this verse 8 alone, three times. And then in verse 7, he had mentioned my servant Job. Now verse 9 says, in verse 9, he tells us, uh, so in thy past, the Temanite and Bildad, the Shohite, and the Super, the Temanite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. That's commendable. That's commendable that immediately the Lord spoke to them. They didn't argue. We, we, we highlighted some, uh, you know, good principles. We told Job, we're defending you. But God said that defense was not according to his mind and according to his word. And immediately God spoke to them as he commanded them and the Lord accepted Job. And now verse 10 is what Job had been waiting for. Verse 10 is what uh, even believers have been waiting for. Look at verse 10. It tells us in verse 10 what uh, now happened, what God now did. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Significant. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. He gave him twice as much as he had before. If you come to the New Testament and you're looking at James uh, chapter uh, James chapter 5 uh, and verse 11. In James chapter 5 uh, verse 11, you will see what the Lord said about uh, Job by the Holy Ghost. Behold, we count them happy, which endure Ye have heard of the patience of Job, of the endurance of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. That is, you've seen the end result of the Lord. You've seen the reward of the Lord. You've seen the response of the Lord to what Job had done, and to the patience of Job, to the endurance of Job. And it says, you've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. I want you, I want you to uh, think about some things. Say number one uh, is the endurance of Job. The endurance of Job. And that led to what, it, what did it lead to? The endearment in the heart of God concerning Job. And it says, My servant, my servant, my servant, my servant, a lot of times. Because endurance leads to endearment. Not only that, it leads to endowment. The Lord endowed him. And the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. And then it leads to endowment. That he is he now at strength, he had power, he had authority, he had anointing. All the things he lost before, the Lord gave him back. And it was a freshness and fruitfulness 
in his life. The same thing the Lord is telling us, that whatever has happened, whatever might have happened, if we endure, it makes us endeared to the Lord. We endure, and then we're endeared to the Lord. Not only that, he endows us and endures us. It will endure us with the spirit and with the power and with the might and with everything we need because we endure. Isn't that what Jesus said? He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Endure, my brother, in the family over there, whatever is happening, endure. Among uh, the, the brethren in the church, something has happened. You don't really appreciate endure. And uh, in, in life in general, we endure. And it makes us endeared to God. It makes him to endow us. It makes him to endure us. Tonight, as I said, we're talking about the gateway to the highway of full redemption. The gateway, the gateway is the way of repentance. And then we enter in, and we're going to discover a lot. Three points we're going to consider. Number one is the gateway of repentance for a to favored relationship. Now, Job came to a relationship with God, a favored relationship, a wonderful relationship, and the gateway of entry to that favored relationship is repentance. Point number two is the goodwill that regains full redemption. The goodwill that regains full redemption. He was redeemed from the cause of the Lord. He was redeemed from all his sicknesses. He was redeemed from all sin. He was redeemed. There was full redemption for him. And then he had a good will. A good will towards the people that had offended him. A good will towards the people that had slandered him. A good will the, uh, for the people that had uh, uh, condemned him. The good will that now regains the full redemption. Point number three, the guidelines for realizing fresh restoration. The guidelines. How we have the guidelines now, and we're going to have fresh restoration, full restoration. We're going to have the final restoration too. We come to point number one. Point number one is the gateway of repentance to favored relationship. What's the gateway? Look at Job chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 5. In Job chapter 42, verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. I have revelation now. I have understanding now. I have enlightenment now. Now my eye sees thee. And then he tells us in verse 6, he says, Wherefore, because of that, wherefore, because of what I now see, what I now know, because of the revelation that is given to me now, I have called myself and repent in dust and ashes. And I want you to understand, once somebody repents, God does not delay the uh, relationship, does not delay the favor, does not delay the goodness flowing to that person's life. And that's what we as leaders, we need to tell our people something bad has happened, something um, which is a transgression has happened, and they repent and they come to the Lord genuinely. The Lord forgives immediately and he brings them to the right relationship with himself. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, and Job had responded very well, the Lord said unto Eliphaz uh, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right. Look at this, look at this. As my servant Job. Which means Job now had a good relationship with the Lord. As my servant Job. And the, the word of God tells us uh, in uh, Nehom, chapter in Nehom. It tells us uh, that... At the, what had happened to Job, that thing will not come back again. That affliction will not strike, will not arise the second time. And then in Psalm 51, reading from verse 7, the repentance of Job, the turning and out of Job, look at what it had done. In Psalm 51, verse 7, it says, Purge me, verse 7 says, Purge me with this soap, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and 
I shall be whiter than snow. On what grounds? On what basis? Look at verse 17. In verse 17 of that Psalm 51, it tells us very clearly, it said, The sacrifices of God, a broken spirit, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. The sacrifices of God, a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because it was broken and because it really repented out of contrition, out of conviction, out of sorrow for sin, then relationship came, a good relationship. And actually, as we read about uh, the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, in Luke chapter 15, we're told about the prodigal son and you will see what happened to him and you will see the decision he made and you'll see it's based on on repentance and that repentance is the gateway into the heart of the father into the into the peace of the father and into the goodness of the lord it tells us in luke chapter 15 reading from verse 18 i will arise and go to my father and i will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee he was making up his mind this is what i'm going to do and i'm going to get myself down i'm going to afford myself i'm going to reveal to my father the evil i have done in going away from the family then he says in verse 19 he didn't only imagine i will i never did it you see there are people i will repent they never do I will turn around, they never do. I will change my ways, they never do. I see that this way is wrong and this way is not all right. I'm going to turn around. They are only proposing and proposing and they never do. But in the case of the prodigal son, he said, I will arise and he says, I will no more, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Look at what he did now in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. He arose and came to his father. Remember, he went to a far country. And then he decided in that far country, I'm coming back home. I'm going back to my father. And all through the way from the far country until he got to the father's house, he never changed his mind. Maybe some old friends were calling him. He never changed his mind. Maybe he was think of the shame he might have if he goes back to the father's house. He didn't think about that, and he didn't allow that to pull him back. And he kept on going, kept on going, kept on going, and he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, because now he sent it through the gate of repentance, he was yet a great way off. The father, his father saw him and had compassion on him. And the father ran, think about that, and the father ran. Maybe he was still calculating his steps and going slowly and all that. And then the father saw him apart of Jesus told that story. And, and uh, he told the story to help you, to help me, to help us, that the father is more desirous of forgiving you than you are even desiring that forgiveness. The father is uh, more willing to take you in uh, than you are willing to come in. Yourself is thinking of you. The time you've been away from the Lord, anyone who has been away from the Lord, the father is thinking about such a person. And the father ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Verse 21. In verse 21 it says, and the, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. You see, eh, before he was saying, I'm worthy, give me what belongs to me. I want this and I want that. But now, true repentance makes us understand we're not worthy of anything. Anything we have is of the mercy of God. And he says, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. In verse 22, he says, But if the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring of authority, a, a ring of endearment, a ring of endowment, a ring of endowment, a ring of uh, possession, on his hand and shoes on his feet. And then he tells us the next verse over there in verse 23 and bring hither 
they parted calf and kill it. It's like the father was prepared for him. The father had reserved all that he was going to do and the parted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. In verse 24, this is the conclusion for that prodigal son. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Heaven is happy. Angel, the angels are happy. The church is happy. When a single prodigal son, a single prodigal daughter, a single prodigal father, a single prodigal mother, a single prodigal worker, a single uh, prodigal pastor, a single prodigal minister or member that has gone astray comes back, heaven is happy, God is happy, the Lord Jesus is happy, and the kingdom of God, all the citizens of the kingdom, they are happy too. You remember in the case of, uh, of uh, Peter, uh, we're reading now from Matthew chapter 26. I'm just going to look at the last verse there in verse 75. Verse 75, because uh, Peter had done what he shouldn't have done, said what he shouldn't have said, and he thought, I blew it. The Lord warned me and see what I've done. Look at verse 75 there, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Look at this. And he went out and wept bitterly. And he went out and wept bitterly. What was the attitude of Jesus? The Lord Jesus received him. Recognize that repentance, you see. Repentance is the gateway to the favor of God. Repentance is the gateway to the goodness of God. And as you look at Mark chapter 16, verse 7, Mark chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Look at that. He said, tell his disciples, but in particular, don't forget, don't forget, tell Peter as well. Why? Because he's come into relationship. He's come into endearment. He's come into favor. And he's come into the mercy of God. He has been accepted now. Him will I accept the moment somebody repents and turns away from sin and turns to the Lord and turns to the Savior, the Lord will receive. It tells us in Acts chapter 3 verse 19, Acts chapter 3 verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore, because the Lord will receive. Repent ye therefore, because the Lord will bring you into fellowship. Repent ye therefore, because the Lord will not push you away. The Lord will not reject you. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When somebody repents, when a sinner repents, when a backslider repents, anyone uh, like Job that said, I repent in doors and ashes. Every wrong thing is said from chapter 3 to chapter 30, 37. Every wrong thing is said, everything was forgiven. The same thing with us. Anything we've done wrong, when we repent and we come to the Lord and we hold on to Him and we say, You are my Lord, You are my Savior, the moment we hold on to Him like that, everything will be forgiven. And then we come into this freshness of fellowship and the favor of the, of the relationship. We come into that. In that Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing. Look at that. That shall come from the presence of the Lord. The times of repression shall come from the presence of the Lord. And verse 20, look at verse 20. There it says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Verse 21 says, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution. That's what there means, until the time of the restoration of all things. He restore favor unto us. He restore peace unto us. He restore the, the possession unto us. Everything in our relationship with God, the times of restoration of all things 
which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You'll see then all the goodness that he says he'll give us, that it is that repentance that brings us to the, uh, to the favor of God and to the goodness of God. Now, when we repent and we come to God like that, what does he do? And what do we have? Number one, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. The peace that the Lord gives himself. You see, when somebody has gone, has gone astray, has done something wrong, the peace that ought to be there will not be there. But now we repent and we come to the Lord and we have peace with God. We don't really have peace with God. We have partnership with God. And because of the repentance, he brings us into the family. You are my son. I'll be a father unto you. And you'll be my son. And you'll be my daughter. We also have the promises of God. All the promises become ours because we have repented and because we come to know the Lord. Not only that, we know that the peace is there. We know that the promises are there. We have privileges in Christ privileges in God, all the privileges of the family, all the privileges of the household the Lord gives unto us. And eventually, we have the paradise of God, the paradise of God. Because of that repentance, what a good thing as you repent, what a good thing as you call upon the Lord, what a good thing as you say, Lord, I come back home, I come back to you, and I want all the privileges of repentance and redemption and favored fellowship to come unto me. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If peradventure, God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We instruct the people. We teach the people. We enlighten the people. Like eventually the prince of Job were enlightened and now they recovered themselves from all that they had been saying before, and they came to repentance too by the acknowledging of the truth. And then Job prayed for them. The same thing, the people today who have gone astray, people today who have said something wrong, people today who have transgressed, as they come to know the Lord in this new relationship built up by repentance, that they may recover themselves, that's in verse 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will, at his will, where they are instructed, and because of that instruction, they are now come, they are now coming to a fresh relationship, a new relationship. Can that happen to a believer? Can a believer repent of anything? Yes. Can somebody with civil abuse repent of anything? Yes. How about that? Look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. He's talking to the minister. He's talking to the pastor. The angel of the church at Ephesus. He has said, I know your works. I know everything that you have done. I know how you will not even compromise with the false apostles. And you have tested and tried them. And you know that they are liars. And you have taken your stand. But all the same, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast let thy first love. You see, we have to repent if we have let a, a false consecration, a false love, a false compassion, a false passion, a false zeal for the Lord. If we have lost our false faith, if we have lost our false dependence upon God, we have to repent. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against them. Did he actually go away from the Lord fully? And did he go away from the work of God fully? Did he go away from the preaching of the gospel fully? Did he go away from ministering to the people of God fully? But the first love was not there anymore. Has that happened to any of us during this uh, pandemic? The way we used to read our Bible, the way we used to pray, and the way we used to have the passion, the compassion, and the zeal for the work of the Lord. Are we getting cool? 
Are we getting, uh, are we uh, retreating? Are we diminishing? Are we decreasing our commitment? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast led thy first love. What are we to do? In verse 5 it says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. You see that? Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. And do the false works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. There's something wonderful about the Lord. He doesn't want us far away. He doesn't want us away at all. And he's expecting when something goes wrong, repent immediately, and keep short accounts of the Lord. And he says, the relationship will come back immediately. But if we don't repent, we risk being rejected by the Lord. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. But be, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. He's talking to us, minister. He's talking to us, preachers. He's talking to us, pastors. He's talking to us, overseers. He says, your life is all right. You're praying. You have the first love. You have the consciousness. You have the commitment, but now I about members of the church, I about the members of the assembly, I about the children, I about the youth, I about the campus students, I about the women, I about the singles, I about the married people. How about the people who were strong before and they were giving to the Lord before, but now they're getting and they're backsliding? And it says, But what you are strengthening the things and strengthening the people that remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. And then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, it says, remember therefore how thou hast received when you first received the commission. When you first received the ministry, when you first received the assignment, when you first received the responsibility, how you received and heard and hold fast and repent. To repent there just means come back to the way you were doing it and the way the Lord appreciated before. And it says it is only that that will make the Lord himself happy with us. Then we come back into that fresh and favored relationship and then we come to the goodness of the Lord. In that Revelation chapter 3 verse 3, Revelation chapter 3 verse 3, it says that as we do that, Revelation 3, 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the good will. The good will that regains the full redemption. The good will that regains full redemption. We're coming back to Job chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 7. Job chapter 42, reading from verse 7, and it was so. After the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, he settled on the Lord, he repented of what he had said wrong, and he came to this wonderful relationship, even relationship now, and after that, the Lord must uh, talk to Eliphaz, and he must talk to his two friends. And the Lord now said unto Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee, and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job. As my servant Job. You remember we've uh, studied the, the book of uh, Job itself, what those friends were saying. Uh, if you look at those statements, the statements they made at face value, the statements were correct. And the statements exalted God, and the statements uh, honored God, and the statement condemned Job uh, as a result of what he was going through. And you would have thought God would say, well done, you've said right. 
you know, it's not enough to say the right thing. We must say the right thing to the right person for the right purpose. And we must say the right thing to little people and to encourage people. But in their own case, they were not encouraging Job. In their own case, they were not uplifting Job. In their own case, they were not even counseling well. And they were not comforting Job. And that's why the Lord said that they have not spoken the right thing about him like Job is servant as. But you know, when God says something is wrong, he also gives us a way to remedy and a way to correct whatever has gone wrong. That's why you find in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and, and go to my servant Job. The Lord directed them how their seas will be, will be cleansed away. He directed them how all the evil things they said will be taken King we were gotten rid of. He said, Go to him, my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a bond offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. You couldn't miss it. When the Lord outlined everything, what they were to do and how they were to do it, and then the favor of God will come and the forgiveness of God will come. But now he said, Him, Job, that will pray for you, that will intercede for you, him will I accept. He says, Lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have not spoken of me the sin which is right like my servant Job. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, And so Eliphaz the Temanite immediately without wasting time and built the Shuhite without any argument among them and so far the Temanite without giving excuses. The three of them went and they did according as the Lord commanded them the Lord also accepted Job. The Lord also accepted Job. What does that mean? The prayer he prayed for his friends. The Lord accepted. The forgiveness he demanded for them, the Lord accepted. The new relationship they were to come to with the Lord now because of uh, their coming and their repenting and their turning and their regretting what they had said before, the Lord accepted Job. And then he tells us uh, in verse 10, in verse 10 it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job. See that? Without even praying for himself, the Lord turned the captivity of Job. The goodwill he had to his friends, the goodwill he had so that he would uh, pray for them, he'll forgive them, he'll overlook what they have done. That goodwill made the Lord to turn his captivity. The same thing with us, that when we pray for our friends, when we pray for our neighbors, when we intervene for them, when we help them to come out of the wrath of God, that same favor will come to us, our captivity will be turned. And if there's any captivity in your life, as you minister to others, as you help others, as you encourage others, as you stand in the gap between the people and the Lord, the Lord himself will turn your captivity. Joy will come. Look at Psalm 126. Psalm 126, and I'm reading here from verse 1. Psalm 126, reading from verse 1. When the Lord turns again the captivity of Zion, we were like them the dream, he turned the captivity of Job, and then he turned the captivity of Zion. It says in verse 2, in verse 2, it says, Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord has done great things for them. In verse 3, it says, Yes, yes, the Lord has done great things for us, therefore, we are glad, therefore we rejoice, therefore we are happy. You know what Job did? He prayed for his friends and then the Lord turned his captivity. You know what you have to do? You counsel, you pray, you intervene, you help, you encourage people and you bring them back to their rules and back to the place they ought to be. And when you do that, 
captivity will be removed out of your life. It tells us in uh, chapter 130, that is Psalm 130, reading from verse 7, Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. With him is full redemption. With him we can regain redemption, total redemption, complete redemption, as we do what the Lord has said. You uh, make sure that you are ministering. You make sure that at this difficult time in the country, at this difficult time in the continent, at this difficult time in the world, you are reaching out to people who might not know their way to find their way. You are reaching out to people like Job reached out to his pray to his uh, three prayers, and then the Lord turned uh, his captivity and he gave him. Uh, full redemption. Uh, why don't you look at uh, verse 8 there, Psalm 130, verse 8 it says, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Shall redeem anyone who comes, anyone who turns, anyone who comes to the Lord, he will redeem him from all his iniquities. I want you to connect this with Titus Chapter 2, verse 14. He will redeem Israel from all the iniquities. And now we're looking at Titus, chapter 2, verse 14. And you will see what the Lord has done, who gave himself for us. That's the means of our redemption. Who gave himself for us. That's the source of our redemption. Who gave himself for us. That is the power behind our redemption now. He shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities, but now he gave himself for us that he might redeem us, like redeem Israel, like he promised to redeem Zion, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Now, when we talk of redemption, redemption has many sides. Uh, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 31, reading from verse 11. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. If we apply that to Job, Satan caused his problems, although he didn't know. Satan was standing, Satan was walking, Satan was operating behind a barrier, behind the curtain, and he was stronger than Job. When his captivity was turned and full redemption came, the Lord redeemed Job and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Do you have any battle you are fighting? Any difficulty you have? Do you have any challenge you are facing? The Lord will redeem. And he redeems you from that which is stronger than you are. A disease has been there and is stronger than you can cope with. A calamity has come, is stronger than you can cope with. There is a curse behind the curtain and is stronger than you can cope with. There is uh, something that is happening all the time as you are going on your journey and you say, I cannot bear this, I cannot stand this, I cannot, uh, I cannot do anything with this that is stronger than I. And today I want to assure you that the Lord will redeem you from the hands of him that is stronger than you are. That's part of redemption. In fact, it tells us in Jeremiah, Jeremiah, uh, we're reading here from uh, chapter 15, and I'm reading from verse 20. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 20, And I will make thee unto this people a face brazen wall, the Lord will protect you, and the Lord will preserve your life. The Lord was talking to Jeremiah like he's talking to you, a prophet of God, like he's talking to you, a pastor in the church of the living God, like he's talking to you, a leader among the people of God. And he says, I will make you unto these people a face bracing wall, and they shall fight against thee. Don't stop there, don't stop there. They shall fight against thee in the place you are ministering. What are the forces fighting against you? In the place you are officiating, you know, what are the forces fighting? Fighting against you in the place you leave your accommodation. What are the forces fighting against you? And in the in the life, in everything you're doing, it says they shall fight against you, but 
they shall not prevail against you. Can I have your amen? They will not prevail. Satan will not prevail. Demons will not prevail. Pandemic will not prevail. Epidemic will not prevail. Pestilences will not prevail. The war, the fight, the strife of the people against you, against your family, they will not prevail against you. Why? For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee, says the Lord. I love verse 21. Look at verse 21. It says, And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. Out of the hand of the wicked. Who is that wicked personality that you fear? And you are thinking, they'll finish me. No, they cannot finish you. They will hinder me. No, they cannot hinder you. They will stop my progress and my journey. No, they cannot do that. It says, I will deliver you from the hands of the wicked. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Out of the hand of, uh, of uh, Mr. Terrible, uh, Mr. Terror, uh, Mr. Danger, uh, Mr. Wickedness. Out of the hand of all of them, the Lord will deliver you in Jesus' name. That's redemption. That's redemption. And we have that full redemption. We have that total redemption. We have that uh, perfect redemption and perpetual redemption. In fact, it tells us in Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 68, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Be part of his people. Redemption has come. Be part of the children of God. Redemption has come. He has visited and redeemed his people. He has redeemed his people. And then he tells us in verse 74, in verse 74, it says that he would grant unto us, grant unto you, brother, grant unto you, sister, it will grant unto us, unto you, that we, that you, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Might serve him without fear. Fear of catching pandemic, fear of catching disease, the fear of being destroyed by the things happening. The fear of if I go out, if I reach out to other people, I don't know what will happen to me. I might catch this, I might catch that. It will redeem us from all our enemies that we might serve him without fear. And then in verse 75, it says that we will serve him in holiness, praise the Lord, and in righteousness, glorify God before him all the days of our life. All the days of our life. He has redeemed you. And I pray that that redemption will be real, will be practical in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Actually, if you look at Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us. He has made a curse for us. He has carried your curse. He has carried your you. Is carried all the devastation, destruction, and evil that should have come upon you. He has carried the punishment and the pain of your sin. He has carried everything away. And it says Christ has redeemed us already. It's not like he's going to do it. He's done it already. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord. That we, that we, uh, that uh, be made a cause for us. For it is written, because said is everyone that hangeth on a tree. What's the consequence of that? What's the result of that? In verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ upon you. I said upon you and upon your family. And upon every believer, assure the believers, assure the children of God, assure those members of the church and those workers of the church under your leadership, assure them that no matter how the heat might be, no matter how the curse might appear, no matter from what direction any devastation, any pandemic is coming, he will grant unto them, as he has granted unto you, the blessing of Abraham coming upon you through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we, you and I, that we, your whole family, that we all are members, that we all the children of God, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's all he has granted us. And now look at in Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 38. Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Remember? We're talking of the full redemption. Remember, we're talking about the fact that after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned his captivity. And we're seeing that as we do what the Lord has called us to do, we will have, we will have full redemption. He says that when these things begin to come to pass, What's that? It's been talking about the events of the last days in Luke chapter 21. It says there'll be deception. It says there'll be false prophets. There'll be people that will say, I'm Christ. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be commotion in, in many places. There'll be earthquakes and there will be uh, various uh, sea roaring and the uh, seen in the sky. In fact, it said there'll be perplexity everywhere. And now it says, when you see all those things happening, you know, like those things that are happening today, like what you read in the news, that like what you hear that makes us have a, a total lockdown now or partial lockdown, it says when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws near. It's talking about a final redemption now. We have a redemption today, redemption from sin. We have redemption today, redemption from sickness. We have redemption today, redemption from the power of Satan. We have redemption today, redemption from all the attacks and all the afflictions from the enemy. But then there's going to be a final redemption. For your redemption draws near. In verse 29, it says, And he spake unto them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. In verse 30, it says, When they now shoot forth, and ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now near at hand. In verse 31, it says, So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, when you see all these predictions come to pass, and all the prophecies of eschatology, of the things of the last days, when you see them come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God, your final redemption, full redemption, is at hand. And then in verse 32, it says, Verily I say unto you, this generation, what generation? The generation that sees all those things happening in quick succession, all the wars, all the rumors of wars, the generation that sees all the commotion, and the generation that sees all those earthquakes in multiplied forms, and the generation that sees the gathering, in gathering of the children of Israel, the generation that sees the body of the fig tree. It says, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Our redemption is near. Now verse 33 gives us the assurance that of what Jesus Christ has said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Our redemption is definite. Our redemption is guaranteed. And that redemption will be yours, will be mine, will be ours together in Jesus' name. I'm coming now to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 22. Romans chapter 8 verse 22. For ye know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation. Everybody now is wondering. What is happening? Why this pandemic? What's the source? When is it going to end? When are we going to relax the lockdown? When is this? When is that? There is groaning and pain all over the world, in almost in every country. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. But in verse 23, it says, For not only they, but ourselves also, not only they, the rest of this generation and the rest of creation, but we ourselves also, we ourselves ministers, we ourselves believers, 
as we are locked up, as we are locked down, as we are locked away, and we cannot have the free movement, we are forced to think and we are forced to groan. It's not only the people outside the kingdom that are thinking about this uh, pandemic and this uh, situation. It says we ourselves were grown into which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, look at this, to wait the redemption of our body. We're waiting for that time. Full redemption will come, final redemption will come, total redemption will come. There's present redemption now, and then there's total redemption, there's final redemption, full redemption that is going to come. And we're groaning for that, and we're preparing for that, and we're saying the Lord may come at any time, and because the Lord will come at any time, and we don't want that day of redemption, that day of resurrection, and that day of rapture to meet us on our we're groaning, we're praying, we're preparing, we're keeping ourselves, and they we're looking up and expecting. And then we're told in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And the word of God is assuring us there is a present redemption. There is a continual redemption. There is a total redemption. And then there's the final day of redemption. And it says, we shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we're sealed until, until the day of redemption. Look at verse 31. It says in verse 31, if we're not going to grieve the Spirit of God that has sealed us until the day of redemption, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. We don't have any time for that. We don't have any time for that. We're saved, we're sanctified, we're children of God, and we're happily looking forward to the coming of the Lord. And it says in verse 32, in verse 32, and be ye kind one to another. This is the time, this is the time. People have bodies, and people have challenges, and people have difficulties, and be kind one to another. Let's forget ourselves like Job forgot himself. He was kind to his friends. He was kind to those people that had criticized him. Let's do that too, and our captivity will be torn. Let's do that too, and we're going to have all the supply of the good things the Lord has said he will give. And be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. As God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. And you remember what Job, we were coming back to Job now, in Job chapter 42. You know what he did? He prayed for his friends. And we need to pray for our friends. He intervened for his friends. He stood in the gap between his friends and God who said, I am angry with you. And he helped them to come out of their predicament. He helped them to come out from under the punishment that was waiting for them. That's what we need to do. We need to pray for our friends. We need to intercede for them, our members. We need to intervene for them, for all our members. And we need to help them in every way so that the Lord himself will have a mercy on them and the Lord will accept our prayer. The Lord will accept our ministration. The Lord will accept everything we have done on their behalf. We're coming to point number three now. In point number three, we have the guidelines for realizing fresh restoration. The guidelines for realizing fresh restoration. Look at how it happened to Job. Job chapter 42, and we're reading from verse 10. Job chapter 42, verse 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job, and when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. What could Job desire that he did? Have? Look at uh, verse, um, verse 12 there. In verse 12 it says, And the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. 
the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And God says, I'm God, I change not. That's what God is still willing to do today. And that's what God is still going to do today. In fact, we're told in verse 16. In verse 16, it says concerning Job, concerning the blessing of God upon him, after this lived Job and hundred. After this, no matter how long he had lived before, if you think about it, Job had lived long enough to have ten children in the past. All the ten children died, and also he had that farm, he had servants, and all that. It would be at least seventy. At that time, some people even say, some theologians say, he was about a hundred when all those things happened. But now, after that time, he lived a hundred and forty years, and all that together is beyond two hundred eventually. And he saw his sons, and his sons' sons, even four generations. And then in verse 17, it said, Job, so Job died being old and full of days. That's what the Lord has promised. And that's what the Lord is going to do for everyone. And uh, he tells us, uh, now that the Lord has redeemed him, now that the Lord has turned his captivity, it says that in Nehum, look at Nehum chapter 1 verse 9, something very important there. In Nehum chapter 1 verse 9, what do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end, underline this in your Bible, this is yours, affliction shall not rise up the second time. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. There are some people uh, that say, I'm Job, I'm Job, I'm suffering like Job. And then they get out of the suffering, and they get into that again. And then they keep on saying, I am Job, I'm Job. And then they come out and they get back into that again. And they're still saying, I am Job, I am Job. But you know, Job, Job did not have that over and over and over and over again. If you are claiming to be Job, pray and pray for your friends and do the work of God and let that affliction pass away. And it says in that Nehum chapter 1 verse 9, it says, affliction shall not rise in your life. Affliction shall not come in your family. Affliction shall not come in your ministry. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. He'll seal you. He'll protect you. He'll preserve you. Affliction will not continue in your life. In Jesus' name, he had restoration. He had restoration. And the Lord is assuring us we will have full restoration in Psalm 23, verse 3. Psalm 23, verse 3, it says in verse 3, He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. For his name's sake, he restores my soul. If there is restoration of the material things without restoration of the soul, that's not complete. And without the restoration of your spirit, of your peace, of your joy, of your relationship with the Lord, that's not enough. Look at Psalm 51, verse 12. Uh, Psalm 51, we're looking at verse 12. It says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. The joy of salvation the peace of salvation, the goodness of salvation, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. If the joy of salvation is not there, if it's only a restoration of property, a restoration of field, a restoration of cattle, a restoration of material things, without the restoration, the restoration of the soul, and without the restoration of the joy of salvation, and without the restoration of the staying power of stability in our lives, that will not be enough. And then it says in verse 13, in verse 13, it says, Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Restoration, the Lord will restore, and he'll give us total, complete restoration in Jesus' name. Look at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 14. It's telling us what the Lord has promised he'll do. And shall say, cast ye up, cast ye up. 
prepare the way, take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. Job did something for others. And it is that that made God to restore unto him everything that he had before and to turn the captivity of Job. And the Lord is saying the same thing, that we need to do something for others. And we need to take stumbling blocks away from the path of other people and make the way straight before them. Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way. Take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. We see him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And that's, that's what happened to Job. He was uh, restored and then uh, he was contrite. And as he was contrite, he had conviction. And as he called upon the Lord and approached the Lord, see what happened. And the Lord said, if we will do that, if we will go in that direction too. In Isaiah chapter 57 verse 18. I say, chapter 57, verse 18, I have seen his way. He has contrite heart. He has a humble heart. He has done what I told him to do. He has prayed for his friends. I've seen his ways. He has taken away the stumbling blocks and has cast off the stones away from the path of the people. I have seen his ways. I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. And restore comfort unto him and to his mourners. Look at Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 30 reading from verse 17. It tells us in verse 17, For I will restore health unto thee. It happened to Job. It will happen to you. I will restore health unto thee. He prayed for his friends without even praying much for himself. We pastors, we pray for others. We counsel others. We intercede for others. We lift others up. We encourage others. We reassure them of the love of God. And we reassure them of the mercy of God. While we are doing that for other people, the Lord said, like I did for Job, I'll do for you. I will restore health unto you, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, says the Lord. Whatever wound you have, internal wound, internal bleeding, external bleeding, that ulcer that refuses to be healed, he says, I will heal thee of thy wounds, says the Lord, because he called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion whom no man seeketh after. The Lord is assuring us that He will restore everything we have lost. He will restore abundance back to us in Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 25. Joel chapter 2, reading from verse 25. See the assurance of the Lord, the restoration of the Lord, and the promise that He has made that whatever we have lost during this pandemic, Whatever we have lost during this uh, lockdown, shutdown, whatever we have lost during this difficult time, restoration is coming. Full restoration is coming. Fresh restoration is coming. Flowing and overflowing restoration is coming. Look at that in Joel chapter 2 verse 25. And I will restore to you. Who is that you there? That's me. I said that's me. That you is you as you claim the promise of God. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts are eating. And the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. My great army which I sent among you. And then in verse 26, wonderful promise of God. And you shall eat in plenty. Your farming is over. That localized farming there will be over. And the poverty there will be over. And the strain there will be over. Because he shall eat in plenty. 
and shall be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. Your time has come. He'll deal wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And in verse 27, and it says, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. I am in the midst of Israel, in the midst of my people, and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people, are you there? And my people, I said, are you there? And my people shall never be ashamed. You will not be ashamed in Jesus' name. And now he even tells us, as you look at verse 28, in verse 28 of Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out, I will pour out, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon you, upon your family, upon all the workers, upon all the ministers. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And then in verse 29, it says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will pour out my spirit. The Lord has promised us all things. The Lord has promised us everything we need for life, everything we need for godliness. And he's saying, if we will ask him, if we will ask for others, pray for others, and be at our post of duty, and do everything we're supposed to do, and make sure that no one is lost at this time. Make sure that no member is lost at this time. Make sure that no worker is lost at this time. Make sure that no one goes astray at this time and will reach out in the voice of love, in the voice of mercy, and the hand of help will reach out to everyone. He says, I will grant us full restoration, total restoration, fresh restoration, continual restoration. Let's look finally at Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3 and verse 4. Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according as his divine power. According as his divine power. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. And look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. And it says, Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He has told us, He has given us the guidelines. How, what guidelines has He given us? the guidelines we ought to follow so we can have full redemption, so we can have fresh restoration, so we can have everything that Lord has promised us. Look at how Job did it. First of all, there was recognition. He recognized the almightiness of God, and because of that recognition, he said, Now I repent in dust and ashes this repentance. And after that repentance, it came into relationship with God. Let's reaffirm our relationship with God. And as we reaffirm that relationship with God, and then it goes on to say, we can now stretch out the hand of hell unto other people. And as we do that, the Lord himself is saying, we follow all these that Job had followed. He says, eventually, Restoration will come. Revival will come. It says realization will come. Everything we have lost. We're going to get everything back in Jesus' name. Today we have learned about this word of God, the gateway to the highway of full redemption. The gateway to the highway 
of poor redemption. And he wants us to enter in through that gateway of repentance, for favored relationship, and then the goodwill that regains the full redemption and the guidelines that he has shown us in the word of God in realizing fresh restoration. And I pray the word of God will be a fruit in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Rise up and we'll talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has revealed himself to us today. He has revealed his word to us and has shown us very clearly that we can have a restored fellowship and we can have redemption and we can have total, fresh restoration. Pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you for what you have revealed. I see the things have not been doing well. I see the things have not done enough. And now I repent. I need to regain, I need to recover my first love, my first passion, my first compassion, my first zeal, my first earnestness, my first drive, my first desire. I need to regain all that. And Lord, I repent of any laziness. I repent of any lukewarmness. I repent of any backwardness. I repent of sloth, sluggishness. I repent of not doing the work faithfully as I ought to. And I bring back myself, all my resources, all my energy, all my strength, all my fervency, all my zeal. I bring everything back. Quicken me, Lord. Energize me, Lord. Empower me, Lord. And Lord, I pray that your fire will burn again in my soul, in my spirit, in my bones. I pray that that zeal will come back once again. And then I come to this favored relationship with you. I repent of anything I have not done the right way. And I'll do your work now. I'll concentrate and do it with all my heart, with all faithfulness, so I can bear more fruit. And Lord, I'll have goodwill. Those who have criticized me, I'll pray for them. I'll have goodwill. Those who have slandered me, I'll pray for them. I'll have goodwill. Those who have opposed me, I'll pray for them. Those who have condemned me, I'll pray for them. I have the goodwill and those who have said anything wrong, done anything wrong, and they have not uh, kind of repaid the good that have done unto them, I have goodwill towards them. And as you have said, I shall pray for them, it have been for them, and I shall intercede for them. Lord, I will, Lord, I will. And then you will regain full redemption. And now the guidelines we ought to follow. The guidelines we ought to follow. From recognition to revelation of the truth of the word of God. And we hold on to that revelation. And we hold on to that repentance. I will not look back again to the careless ways of the past. And the faithless ways of the past. And the sluggish ways of the past. We bring back our first love. We bring back our first faith. We bring back our first consecration. We lay everything on the altar. Absolute surrender unto you, even from now on. And Lord, we'll do your work and reproduce believers. We'll do your work and reproduce those who are zealous for the kingdom of God will do your work and watch over the people that you are placed under our care, under our ministry. We'll do everything you have told us to do for prayer, for counseling, with watchfulness, with intercession, everything Lord will do so that the people will be restored your fellowship, they will be restored to your goodness, 
and then they and us, the members and the ministers, the people of God and the preachers, the pastors, together will continue to serve you, strengthening your people for the work you have given us to do, that this work will prosper in our hands. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for our leaders' development session. And we thank you for what you have taught us. We thank you for what you have revealed. We thank you, Lord, for the turning around of the captivity of Job. And the same thing you are doing for all your people now. Turn every world's captivity around in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, with new zeal and new strength and new power and new purpose and new driver and new energy and new, uh, new passion, we'll continue to do this work in Jesus' name as we pray for others, intercede for others, intervene for others, stand in the gap for others, as we protect them from the coming judgment, as we serve as preventive ministers from the devastation that will come at the end of this world. And as we minister to your people appropriately, we know while we're working for you, you're working on our behalf. While we're serving you and serving the people of God, you will be ministering to us as well. We thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. And every promise you've given us for life, for godliness, every promise you have given us for personal and for our families, every promise you have given us for total restoration and full redemption and favor the fellowship and relationship, every promise you have given us for spirit, soul, and body, fulfilling every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And the earnestness in doing the work, the power to do the work, the excitement to do the work, the joy of service you give to every one of us. And we pray this work will prosper in everyone's hands in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you very much for being present today. And we bless the Lord for what the Lord has told us and taught us. And I pray that this word will be practical in every one of our lives. Reach out. Don't just store it there in the head, in the mind. Reach out and go and tell other people. Help other people. Pray for them. Counsel them. Intercede for them. Intervene for them. And the Lord will turn every form of captivity out away from your life and your family and ministry in Jesus' name. Thank you once again and God bless you.